In October of 2021, about four months before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, U.S. military analysts from the Pentagon and the various intelligence agencies met in a special briefing with President Biden at the White House. The consensus was certain. Vladimir Putin was definitely going to launch an invasion of Ukraine sometime within the following six months. They knew there wasn't much they could do to stop Putin, though they could warn Ukraine. They also arranged to send some immediate assets, mostly manned portable air defense systems or man pads, like Stinger shoulder-fired rockets, along with similar types of anti-tank systems. They can also talk sternly to their Russian counterparts, reminding them what repercussions the invasion would have with their EU and other global trading markets. But most importantly, the Pentagon was concerned that such a war in NATO's backyard had the possibility of escalating the conflict to a point where Putin might choose to use Russia's vast arsenal of nuclear weapons. Months after the October meeting, General Mark Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, admitted that he still carried a set of note cards in his briefcase that encapsulated the U.S.'s strategic objectives. There was one primary goal, figure out how to support Ukraine's military defense without allowing the conflict to spiral out of control into World War III. The Pentagon analyst came up with four strategic objectives. Number one, don't allow Ukraine's defensive effort to become a direct war between the U.S. and NATO forces against Russian forces. Number two, maintain NATO unity. Number three, support Ukraine militarily and economically with everything they need to defend themselves. And number four, contain the war inside the geographical borders of Ukraine. Rules 1, 2, and 3 have proceeded smoothly enough, but there is a lingering problem with rule number 4. Containing the war within Ukraine's geographic borders has been a real challenge. Moscow's greed versus Ukraine's need It's been clear for quite some time that Putin wanted to take over all of Ukraine beginning in 2014, when Russian troops wearing plain green uniforms with no official insignia invaded parts of eastern Ukraine and the Crimean Peninsula. While jokingly blaming the attacks on little green men, Putin finally embraced the annexation efforts of the pro-Russian puppet governments he installed there. Putin made his intention clear for a wider escalation of the war in mid-2021, less than a year before the full invasion when he published a 7,000-word article on the supposed historical unity between Russians and Ukrainians. This article, less a serious piece and more a fantasy novel, was filled with imagined grievances and false assertions. Russians and Ukrainians, Putin argued, were one people, an idea based in Putin's misleading claims about blood ties. He complained bitterly that Russia had had its own territory stolen by a unified West that always has been plotting against them. Despite the 1991 agreement between Ukraine and the Russian government that guaranteed Ukraine's national borders, Putin has always perceived Ukraine as one of the lost elements of the former Soviet Union. He also believed there was a need to return them to full Russian control, no matter how that would be accomplished. He had orchestrated a similar takeover, although mostly a bloodless one, when he managed to install the dictator Alexander Lukashenko in control of Belarus, though that control has been shaky. As many as 35,000 opponents and protesters have been arrested in the past three years alone, while defection from his army that joined up with the Ukrainians has shown Lukashenko that he cannot trust his own troops to stay loyal to him. During the early stages of the war, when Lukashenko agreed to allow some Belarus soldiers to aid Russia's attack on Kyiv, several hundred left to join Ukrainian forces. Many observers outside of the two combatant nations believe Ukraine has every right to fight back against the invading Russians any way they can. That would include attacking bases inside of Russia, where their air force launches fighters and bombers that then fire missiles and rockets at Ukrainian targets. These same outsiders believe that any artillery shooting into Ukraine should also be viable targets, even if they're firing from within Russia itself. The Atlantic Council, a nonprofit think tank that unites Northern American and European analysts and politicians, said in a report published in November 2022, Ukraine has legal rights to hit back inside Russia, but is currently not being permitted to do so by partners who support Kyiv cannot afford to lose. The problem is that those partners in the West, the United States and NATO, are trying to prevent any further escalation of the war, that overarching goal that General Milley referred to. Much of the reluctance that the West has in providing Ukraine with advanced missiles and jets is the concern that Ukraine would use them to attack targets inside Russia, which Putin would then use as an excuse to employ his one remaining trump card, tactical nuclear weapons, for which Ukraine has no response. The Atlantic Council put it succinctly, the current approach grants Putin impunity to continue attacking and escalating without fear of a proportionate response. It has resulted in a surrealistic war where the aggressor benefits from guarantees that any destruction will be limited to the territory of his victim. This is particularly evident in the devastating recent Russian attacks on Ukraine's critical civilian infrastructure which will keep getting worse until Ukraine regains its right of retaliation.
Indeed, since November, the world has witnessed catastrophic damage done to Ukraine's cities and civilian infrastructure. Russia has intentionally targeted refugee centers, hospitals, housing complexes, schools, and electric grids. A great majority of these attacks have come from outside of Ukrainian territory, since Russian planes have been shot down in high numbers over the battlefields themselves. Publicly, Ukrainian President Zelensky has said they do not and will not attack targets inside Russia. As recently as May 14, 2023, Zelensky promised that their much-anticipated counteroffensive will focus on Ukrainian territory. But privately, Zelensky chafed at the restrictions. In stolen top-secret documents released across social media platform Discord beginning in February 2022, private communications and discussions between Zelensky and his advisors suggest he was much more willing to attack Russian territory. He suggested that Ukraine could capture lightly defended Russian border regions and use them as leverage against Russian troops still occupying Ukrainian territory. He floated the idea of blowing up an oil pipeline between Russia and Hungary, a member of NATO, though Hungary's own autocratic ruler Viktor Orban has often sided with Russia and on occasion even blocked military aid from NATO to Ukraine. In talks between Zelensky and some of his top generals in late February 2022, he expressed concern that Ukraine does not have long-range missiles capable of reaching Russian troop deployments in Russia nor anything with which to attack them. Zelensky then suggested that Ukraine could use drones instead of missiles to attack known military deployment positions in the region of Rostov in western Russia, according to one of the previously classified documents. After the classified documents were made public, Zelensky was asked if he had ever suggested occupying parts of Russia. In an interview he gave to the Washington Post in Kyiv, he dismissed the U.S. intelligence claims as fantasies, yet reiterated his country's right to use any tactics in order to defend its people. Ukraine has every right to protect itself, and we are doing that. Ukraine did not occupy anyone, but vice versa," Zelensky said. When so many people have died and there have been mass graves and our people have been tortured, I am sure that we have to use any tricks. Though Ukraine has received billions of dollars worth of advanced weapon systems, U.S. President Biden has repeatedly refused Ukraine's request for the long-range Army tactical missile system, also known as ATACMS, which have a range of over 185 miles. Since the start of the war, Biden has said that the U.S. is not encouraging or enabling Ukraine to strike beyond its borders. He has given the same reasoning behind the U.S.'s reluctance to provide Ukraine with more advanced aircraft like the F-16 Strike Eagle, which could be used to fire missiles into Russian territory, the exact thing Russia is now doing with their own attack aircraft and strategic bombers, or even to carry out air-to-air -air combat closer to Russian air bases. Although this has been put into question since Biden has confirmed that he will allow Ukraine to use F-16s. But does Zelensky even need to commit his own troops and weapon systems in risky cross-border attacks? Is it possible that Russians are performing exactly the kind of counterattacks that Ukraine would like to do themselves? Waging War Inside Russian Territory from almost the beginning of the war in February 2022, there have been a series of damaging explosions and mystery fires all across Russia and portions of Russian-occupied Ukraine, primarily the Donbass region and the Crimean Peninsula. The number of such attacks is too high to discuss in detail. One such list has more than 65 events in just the 10 months of 2022 following the invasion. The sites of these attacks are primarily connected in some fashion to the war, or have been used in the support of Russia's forces waging a war. Military bases and recruiting centers have been attacked, warehouses storing weapons and ammunition have been blown up, trains used to ship men and material to the front have been sabotaged, and oil storage centers have been set ablaze. There are several very high-profile incidents that showcase the inability of Russia to protect itself from such attacks. April 21, 2022, a fire in one of Russia's most important defense research institutes killed seven and was followed hours later by another mystery fire at a nearby chemical plant. April 30, 2022, a massive fire engulfed a coal-fired power plant on the far eastern island of Sakhalin. May 21, 2022, a fire broke out at Russia's famed Central Aerohydrodynamic Institute about 25 miles southeast of central Russia. November 21, 2022, a large warehouse fire close to Moscow's central railway stations caused seven deaths. December 26, 2022, an explosion and a massive fire engulfed 1,800 square meters worth of storage buildings in Novosibirsk. December 31, 2022, part of a Russian nuclear power plant caught fire. January 3, 2023, a series of explosions rocked a military facility in Novoyoskol in Russia's Belgorod Oblast, followed by numerous secondary explosions as ammunition cooked off. January 9, 2023, a military conscription center went up in flames in the city of Bratsk. January 12, 2023, a huge fire engulfed a massive timber processing plant in Siberia. 
April 15, 2023. Explosions and large fire erupted at a tank training area in the city of Kazan in southwestern Russia. March 3, 2023. A mysterious explosion less than 100 miles from Moscow left Putin and his aides scrambling for answers. One of the most prominent explosions was the presumed attack on the bridge that connects the Crimean Peninsula with mainland Russia. On October 9, 2022, an explosion occurred in the roadway portion of the combined road and train bridge. The ensuing fire heavily damaged the railway support structure. As a result, the attack severely limited the amount of traffic that each side of the bridge could carry, which is a main supply artery for Russian troops in Crimea. The explosion occurred the day after the 70th birthday of Russian President Vladimir Putin, though Ukraine claimed they did not order the attack. Partisan activity, train derailments, fires, and explosions seem to be everywhere across Russia and Crimea. And though Moscow and Putin's minions had plenty of blame to cast, not one saboteur was ever caught. Out of the hundreds of incidents, the only individual ever arrested was the woman who handed the explosive packed statue to a Russian mill blogger, and even then, it wasn't clear whether she was duped into doing it. With the hundreds of other attacks, the people involved were never caught. One of the most highly publicized attacks was a drone strike against one of the buildings near Red Square in Moscow just days before the annual victory parade on May 9th. Ukrainian President Zelensky denied this attack was their handiwork, and most analysts agree there are too many elements that suggest this was a false flag attack, including the surprisingly crystal clear photography of the incident from multiple angles at 2 o'clock in the morning, along with the fact that there were two unidentified people climbing the exterior staircase at precisely the right moment. Still, whether this was a false flag orchestrated by Putin or a daring drone strike from the anti-Putin Russians, the attack underscored just how vulnerable all parts of Russia seem to be these days. Recent Ukrainian Admissions Only recently has Ukraine admitted to carrying the war into Russia itself. For example, it wasn't until mid-May of 2023 that Ukraine admitted to targeting pro-Russian propagandists. Major General Kirilo Budanov, the head of Ukraine's military intelligence service, admitted in an interview for a YouTube channel that Ukraine successfully targeted quite a few people that were known as Russian propagandists. There have been several high-profile attacks against Russian pro-war commentators since the beginning of the war, including the death in a car bomb of the daughter of Alexander Dugin, an ideologue known as Putin's philosopher, in August of 2022. That blast was thought to have been meant for Dugan himself, as his daughter was driving Dugan's car and Dugan was driving hers. Then there was the death of well-known online supporter Vladin Tatarsky, known as the pro-Wagner military blogger, who was killed by an exploding statue of himself inside a St. Petersburg cafe in April 2023. Then in May 2023, Zakhar Prayelpin, Russian nationalist writer, politician, and vocal supporter of the invasion of Ukraine, was seriously injured in a car bomb attack in the Nizhny Novgorod region that killed his driver and flipped their car onto its roof. The combination of hundreds of mysterious fires, attacks on infrastructure by what appear to be saboteurs, destruction of rail lines by what Moscow called partisan activity, and drone and missile attacks on bases distant from the Ukrainian border all suggest that either Ukraine was actively attacking Russian targets or the anti-Putin elements in Russia were able to get their hands on sophisticated weaponry and plenty of volunteers. The concept of Russian volunteers would soon reach a whole nother level. The Belgorod Invasion in the early morning hours of May 22, 2023, several explosions occurred in the region adjacent to Ukraine called Belgorod, a Russian oblast, followed by a small but significant armed incursion by two Russian volunteer units fighting along with Ukraine. The Belgorod area and its main city of the same name had been part of the short-lived country of the Ukrainian People's Republic in 1918 until both were taken over by the Red Army in late 1918. To this day, though, Belgorod residents primarily speak Russian, although they do speak a dialect of Russian with heavy Ukrainian influences. The identity of the attackers was unknown at first, but it soon became apparent that there were two main units, the Russian Volunteer Corps RTK, and the Freedom of Russian Legion LSR. They had crossed the border from Ukraine into the Belgorod region of Russia, accompanied by two tanks, an armored personnel carrier, and nine other armored infantry vehicles, plus an assortment of light trucks and unarmored civilian vehicles. This sudden and barely opposed invasion caught everyone by surprise, especially the defending Russian border guards. A tweet from a group calling itself the Free Russian Legion encapsulated the feelings of most Ukrainians. 
a reminder that you don't get to invade someone's country and then dictate the terms under which they can resist your invasion. Ukraine has every moral and legal right under international law to take the fight to Russia on the territory of the Russian Federation. The chaos of that first morning's attack was summed up later by this tweet. The Russian army is actually shelling the Russian city of Belgorod to stop the Russians who have come to liberate Russia. Amid all the rumors and speculation, Ukrainian presidential advisor Mikhailo Poldogak said that they had nothing to do with the unfolding events. Ukraine is watching the events in the Belgorod region of Russia with interest and is studying the situation, but has nothing to do with it, he said. Of course, the Ukrainian army had to have known of the units and their convoy of military vehicles since it originated from the Ukrainian side of the border. The official Russian PR response was scattershot and full of disinformation. Officials in Moscow blamed Ukraine for sending in a cross-border sabotage and reconnaissance group. They claimed that the attack had already been quelled by the evening of the same day. According to the regional governor Vyacheslav Gladkov, the Ministry of Defense and all law enforcement agencies have entered the territory to carry out combat missions to protect our country. Gladkov added that despite a reported eight civilian casualties, there had not been any fatalities. Later reports, however, admitted that one Russian border guard had been killed in the initial attack. What's most interesting about this event is not just that ex-Russian soldiers have joined the Ukrainian-backed separatists, but that the Russian government admitted that it had been storing tactical nuclear weapons in a suburb of Belgorod known as Grevoron, only 40 miles from the Ukrainian border. When the uprising occurred, Russia had to quickly move those nukes out of the area and further back from the battle zone. It's clear that the Ukrainian government knew of the nuclear weapons depot and its exact location, as well as what was stored there. In a lengthy conference call later on May 22nd, Andrei Yusov, a spokesman for Ukraine's military intelligence directorate, called the Russian facility by its official designation Military Unit No. 25624 and noted that its position in Grevoron was an administrative center of the Belgorod Oblast and was close enough to the Ukrainian border that this small military effort caused the nuclear weapons there to be hastily removed. This raises several other serious questions. Was Ukraine, through these Russian units attempting to capture those weapons, to use them against Russia or to have them on hand to threaten Putin the next time he threatens to use nukes in the war, as he's done multiple times already? Is it possible that other separatists might try to steal those weapons to aid Ukraine? Are there other stockpiles of tactical nukes that are also this close to the Ukrainian border? Will Russia decide to move them back as well? And what was the point in having such a dangerous weapon so close to the border? Despite Russia's official prognostication that all the invaders had been killed that first day, by the end of day two, the two groups were continuing to send out images of them holding the territory in and around Belgorod city itself, while reports were coming in of two additional incursions across the Russian border to the east of the Belgorod attacks. The easternmost of these three enclaves near the border town of Kozinka had tripled in size within just 24 hours. The insurgents in just two days had managed to gain control of more than 40 square miles of Russian territory compared with the 60 square miles around the city of Bakhmut that cost the Russian armed forces 100,000 casualties and took almost 10 months to accomplish. Now, don't be fooled by Ukraine's claims that they had nothing to do with these attacks. Despite the units being made up of ex-Russian citizens, the equipment and coordination did come from Western sources via Ukraine. Having begun within hours of Russia's claims to have fully taken Bakhmut, these strikes, though they may have eventually been evacuated, served as a masterful diversion of Russian forces, which will only improve Ukraine's chances of greater success when they launch their counteroffensive. The threat of further uprisings within Russian territory. While these attacks continued apparently without much resistance from Russian military units, there were images of the Legion's logo, a capital L with an arrow underneath facing to the right, being spray-painted in the region of the Kursk Oblast. Gunfire was being reported in some of the cities there, while additional insurgents were being reported occupying the city of Golgolevka near the Ukrainian border northwest of the Belgorod incursion. When asked why these troops were conducting this assault on Russian territory, one spokesman replied, The Legion, Freedom of Russia, and the Russian Volunteer Corps are conducting an operation on the territory of the Belgorod region to create a security strip to protect Ukrainian civilians. This area had long been used to launch rocket and artillery attacks against Ukrainian civilians throughout the war. The Ukrainian government was quick to point out that despite the Western origin of some of the equipment the groups were using, which appeared to include US-made Humvees and MRAP anti-mine infantry vehicles, all of the troops engaged in the operation were Russians. Ukrainian presidential advisor Mikhailo Podolyak said, The only driving political force in a totalitarian country of tightened screws is always an armed guerrilla movement. 
and then as a response to Putin's claims that the Russians invading the Donbass and Crimea in 2014 were simply local citizens armed with weapons you could buy in any military surplus store, Podolyak added, as you know, tanks are sold at any Russian military store, and underground guerrilla groups are composed of Russian citizens. Why is Zelensky willing to allow his country to be destroyed? There are people in the West, including some in various political circles in the United States, who think the way to end this war is for Ukraine to simply agree to a peace settlement, allowing Putin to claim a victory by holding on to the eastern portion of Ukraine along with Crimea. They ask why Zelensky is allowing the kind of destruction that's been seen in Mariupol, Bakhmut, Kherson, and the dozens of other cities that have been shelled and bombed beyond recognition by Russian forces. At the 2023 G7 summit held in Hiroshima, Japan, President Zelensky gave a bleak assessment of what was in store for the city of Bakhmut, the center of the prolonged 10-month siege by Russian army units, spearheaded by the private military contractor group Wagner. You have to understand, there is nothing left, he said. Every major building of any size has been destroyed, leaving nothing of Bakhmut as it once stood left to control. A city of 70,000 inhabitants before the invasion has effectively been erased from the earth. A similar fate befell the city of Mariupol during the fighting in 2022. Once a city of more than 500,000 along the Sea of Azov, the city was encircled by Russian and pro-Russian separatist troops in the early months of the war and took heavy bombardment, much of it intentionally targeting civilian and refugee centers. More than three-quarters of the city's residents fled, leaving fewer than 100,000 citizens remaining. Zelensky, however, remained firm. No peace treaty would be reached, he said, until every foot of Ukraine was liberated from Russian invaders. He reiterated again his promise that Ukraine's armed forces would focus only on liberating their homeland, but as evidenced above, there appears to be quite a lot of activity going on inside Russia's borders. What will happen with the war in Ukraine? Ukraine walks a tightrope with this cross-border attack. Zelensky has promised not to invade Russia and only to liberate Ukrainian territory. The selective Ukrainian drone and missile attacks against Russian military targets might be approved by US and NATO advisors, but the free Russian Legion incursions in and around Belgorod are an entirely different matter. Yes, their reasoning is sound. The area had been used to conduct artillery and rocket launches for many months, and pushing the Russian military away from the border could provide a buffer zone to protect Ukrainian civilians. But boots on Russian soil is not the same as missiles or even artillery shells flying through the air. We have yet to see Putin's response to this challenge to his pride as well as the absolute laughing stock his defense force has made of his defensive forces. No country's border should be so porous that a hundred men in a handful of vehicles could just plow right on through as much as 10 or 15 miles deep without meeting any significant opposition. Rest assured, Putin will respond with anger and fury, as he always does. When perceiving how far Putin will go in using his military against other countries, it's important to return to his own words. In his 2021 article about the future of Ukraine, all the subterfuges associated with the anti-Russia project are clear to us, and we will never allow our historical territories and people close to us living there to be used against Russia. And to those who will undertake such an attempt, I would like to say that this way they will destroy their own country. There's no doubt Putin hopes to destroy enough of Ukraine to force them to surrender, but after seeing the amount of destruction taking place within his own borders. Now go watch Could Russia Survive a Nuclear War, or click this other video instead.